Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Mitch Case and I'm with the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings, and much more. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you're interested in becoming a member of the club, you can reach us at admissions at the nationalartsclub.org to learn more. I'm now going to share a message from Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, chair of the club's archeology span committee. Thank you, Mitch. I am Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, chair of the archeology span committee, and delighted to welcome today's audience of approximately 650 attendees worldwide to a fascinating program entitled Love and Sparta. Among the international audience joining from London is Julian Reed, next February's online lecturer. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Anthony Cartledge for this afternoon's special talk presented in collaboration with the St. Petersburg Celebration on the Arts, whose theme this year revolves around love. Dr. Cartledge spoke at the National Arts Club in 2010 about revisiting ancient Greece via Alexandria in Egypt, and two years later, the ancient Olympic Games. This is his second virtual lecture. In December of 2020, he discussed Thebes, Forgotten City of Ancient Greece, with that event viewable on the club's YouTube channel, whose link you'll find included in chat. Today's splendid discourse will subsequently be available online. A.G. Leventis Professor of Greek Culture Emeritus from Cambridge University, Commander of the Order of Honor awarded by the President of Greece, Global Distinguished Professor at New York University, funded by the Hellenic Parliament, Honorary Citizen of Modern Sparta. No one is more knowledgeable about the amatory practices of ancient Sparta. His initial volume, published in 1979, about this extraordinary city, Sparta and Arconia, a regional history has been followed by numerous books as well as countless articles related to this and analogous subjects. According to my notes, in 2012, that is 10 years ago, I first requested a lecture related to Sparta. Well, good things seldom happen quickly, and aren't we the fortunate ones to be hearing today's talk? It is now my pleasure to request that Professor Paul Anthony Cartledge address our audience. Paul, if you will. So let me start off with a few words of thanks. First of all, of course, obviously, to dear Michelle. I hadn't realized this was going to be my fifth performance for you, but I'm absolutely delighted uh, that it is. Thanks, of course, to the National Arts Club as a whole and to especially its committee. Thanks to the St. Petersburg Celebration of the Arts. And that is all the framework within which this talk uh, is being given. I, I'm really honoured to be a participant under that uh, very special aegis. I'm speaking to you from Cambridge, from South Cambridge, where it's just gone 6 p.m. in the evening. And not least, last but not least, thanks to my theatron, which is the ancient Greek term for audience. It also meant, of course, theatre, the physical space. But you are my theatron, and I'm told you're in the really high 600s, uh, perhaps of the order of 650, which is absolutely wonderful. Thank you. I'll try to do justice both to you and to the topic. So let me start with a little about my uh, title slide uh, and my title. I'm going to come back to the image on the screen right at the end because it's going to have a particular application to my subject this evening. But I wanted to just say a little bit about love and a little bit about Sparta. 
want to make um, basically three preliminary points. First of all, I'm going to interpret love broadly. That's to say, so as to include gender, by which I mean masculinity, femininity, uh, attitudes to love, and identities that people adopt or assume, or in some cases, impose, whether collective or individual. As you'll know, this is an extremely hot topic <laughs> at the present moment, at any rate, in certain parts of the Western world. Second preliminary point about my title, love is uh, designed to cover the two main ancient Greek words which are translated by that term in English, which is relatively jejune, relatively poor, compared with the richness of ancient Greek vocabulary. And I mean the two words agapi and eros. They're very different, and sometimes indeed they are opposite. So there's a very broad distinction to be drawn. Agapi, well, I've described it uh, in the preliminary uh, description of my talk as more or less pure, <laughs> i.e. chaste. It's the sort of love that one might have for one's parents or between a husband and wife. And it can also be extended to um, people that you consider within your circle, not physically, not legally related. At your close circle of friends, you feel love for them. And it's that usage which eventually, early Christian period, came to be the expression of the kind of love that early Christian people, of course, many ex-Jewish to begin with, were supposed to feel towards each other. And they had agrapi feasts even, which were a very different matter from the symposia of the classical, the early uh, Greeks, some of which uh, I'm going to be touching upon later. What about eros? Well, the very um, term, of course, gives us in English erotic or eroticism. And fundamentally, love would be a far too tame a translation because it means desire, sexual desire, and if you like, lust rather than love. And that, of course, could be the very reverse of pure and sometimes um, quite painful, both individually and internally. You feel arrows for some love object, that feeling not being satisfied, it pains you, or you feel such an arrows for someone else, you act it out and you behave appallingly. You rape or you in other ways sexually harass and in other ways behave just um, really without consideration for the other person. So eros, dangerous, agapi, relatively quiet and sane. I'm going to be treating both kinds, but just to complicate the picture a little further, ancient Greek being a very rich language, one of the richest, in fact, in human history, had other words for a feeling or an emotion which we might want in certain circumstances to translate as love. But I'm not going to complicate things here. Then the last point about the title, Sparta, um, chronology. Sparta as a city, an ancient city, came into being, scholars generally agree, somewhat, somewhat in the 10th century BC, BCE, before Christ, before the Common Era. And it went on to, well, whenever you think Sparta ended in late antiquity, and after which there was a hiatus before medieval Sparta emerged, which is Mistra in the 13th century. And then modern Sparta, Sparti, of which I'm an honorary citizen, that was not founded until very, very much later. In fact, in the 1820s and 1830s, it got going, 1834. So the Sparta that I'm concerned with is relatively constricted, restricted in its temporal aspect to roughly the 6th, 5th, 
and 4th centuries BC, BC, between roughly outer parameters 600 and 300, though, of course, within that, and actually scholars have huge debates about certain aspects of Sparta, certainly there were changes. I'll just mention one. Whereas in roughly 500 BC, so the time of um, the Persian Wars down to 480, the first two decades of the 5th century BC, there were perhaps 8,000 adult male Spartan citizens, so 20 and upwards. By a century later, 380, 370 BC, BCE, there were just over 1,000 Spartans. A catastrophic drop, the ancient Greek term was oligantropia, a shortage of military manpower, that is adult male military war-ready manpower. The explanation of that, or multiple factorial explanation, hugely controversial. I'm not going to go into that, just to give you an example of change. Um, Sparta, though it had a bit of a reputation for being resistant to change on principle as a mode of social cohesion, uh, I've got some sympathy with that. Yeah. So that's uh, enough about the, the title itself. What about Sparta? That is to say, our impression of it or its figure in the ancient world and from the ancient world to us. Well, ancient Sparta, this is quite extraordinary and it's in itself very revealing, has given us not one, not two, but three words in the English language. Everyone knows about Spartan, tough, austere, self-denying, and the sort of quality that you, you need if you're going to survive in a tough environment. Or conversely, it can be a negative comment. Oh dear, the accommodation was very Spartan, or the diet was very Spartan, meaning unrelievedly awful, <laughs> or, or at any rate, minimal. Jejune. Secondly, laconic. This comes from another word for Spartan, an ancient word, uh, lacone. It's the adjective of lacone, laconicos. And it's applied specifically to a mode of utterance of speech. So I like to think myself of as being somewhat laconic. It's the opposite of verbose. You, you say what you want to say in a minimal, um, possibly clipped, and certainly a military style way of speaking. Now, the third one is not widely known, and people might never have come across it, or very rarely, and it's helot. Now, helot is our English way of spelling the ancient uh, Greek hylotes, which comes from a root meaning captive. And it was the word applied to actually the largest segment of the population of the Spartans home territory, the Helots, of which there were two main ethnic groups, one Messenia, that's southwest uh, Peloponnese, one from Laconia, that's southeast Peloponnese. We don't know exactly how many of them there were ever, but we do know they outnumbered the Spartans considerably. We do know that they were the principal economic basis of the Spartans' lifestyle. We also know that periodically they threatened the Spartans, not just, oh dear, these are unfree people, what might they do to us individually, but might they rise up? collectively in revolt and in such a way as actually to endanger the very existence of the state. So Spartan helot relationships were very often fraught and therefore this is actually a very important word in English because it means a subordinated worker. I'll give you one example. Black workers in South Africa before the uh, recent 1990s reforms, so under apartheid, were referred to both positively and negatively, depending on which side you took, as helotic or helots. So that's, as I say, very good evidence for how influential Sparta 
or rather ideas of Sparta, have been in more recent times. The same was true in antiquity. And because Sparta, rather like the Soviet Union back in the 30s, engendered either great feelings of admiration from afar, I mean, from people outside Sparta, or conversely, huge feelings of disgust and even hatred. There was a real divagation and bifurcation of attitudes to Sparta. And so we historians of ancient Sparta refer to this diversity divergence of ancient sources as the mirage of Sparta. It's not that there isn't anything to what other than Spartans thought of Sparta, though in some cases I believe they were actually making it up from whole cloth. But the evidence for Sparta that they could get to and get at was restricted, and it tended to be filtered through these either positive or negative spectacles. And that situation has continued to this very day. Now, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, one is relatively, you know, innocuous. If you are, as I am, very keen on olive oil, and you know your Thucydides, you know the Spartans were the first to anoint themselves, not to just eat it or cook with it, but to anoint themselves with olive oil. Well, you'll know, therefore, that the modern region of Laconia is a great olive growing uh, culture area. And of course, olive oil, olives are grown for their oil as well as to be eaten, but much is grown for oil and export. Well, there is a brand of, um, well, it's Laconian olive oil from near Monemvasia, and it's called Molone Lave. Now, that's the way the Greeks pronounce an ancient Greek phrase, molon labe. But of course, if you read lave as lave, then it looks a bit like you're washing yourself, so you're anointing yourself with this olive oil. Anyway, that's, if you like, quite harmless. There is, on the other hand, a very, I think, dangerous um, other side, the dark side of the Spartan mirage or myth today, using again that very same phrase, which I'll put in its context, historical context later, Molon Labe. And it's employed by members of gun clubs, especially in your part of the world, that is the state. And it represents the view of those who resent and reject the notion that they should surrender, they should not be carrying arms. So they take Molon Labe to mean, come and get them to the, as it were, Congress or the president. We're not going to give them up. And, well, I'm, I'm not sad to say, because, I mean, it just is the case, but such people tend to be of a right-wing disposition. And until January the 6th, 2021, I thought, well, fine, in the name of tolerance, they should be allowed to practice their membership of gun clubs and to hold the views they hold. On January the 6th, 2021, you know what I'm talking about, the insurrection, the insurgency, the occupation of the capital. Certain members of that occupying force self-identified as avatars of the ancient Spartans. We have their equivalent in my part of the world. There is a bunch in the House of Commons who refers to themselves as Spartans because they are no surrender, you know, we will not give in. And these are the extreme Brexiteers, the ones who took us out of the EU and, you know, over my dead body do we remain in the EU. Anyway, enough about that. So one final preliminary point, and I'm sorry to have kept you all on 10 talks if you're waiting for my slides, the rest of my slides. How odd, how peculiar, how sui generis was ancient Sparta? Now, I'm looking at love, sex, gender identity, but there are all sorts of other ways in which one could examine Sparta under that rubric oddity or normality. So politics, 
uh, militarism, uh, economy, i.e. Sl servitude, slave, and so on and so on. But I'm just looking at um, gender, sexuality, and sex, love, uh, in this lecture. But just to say that this is one of those issues, this is one of those general issues that divides us ancient scholars of Sparta. It's a moving target. Sparta is not a fixed uh, entity on which we moderns all agree. It's still a, a live, hot issue. Right. So let's situate uh, Sparta first broadly within the Aegean. You can see it down there in the southern, southeastern Peloponnese on the river Evrotas. Let's move a little closer in, and this shows you the political boundaries of the polis, the citizen state, which in ancient Greek was called Lacedaemon. And so the people who live there, including the Spartans, are Lacedaemonioi. That's uh, yet another name. Spartans interestingly had three different names uh, for themselves. Spartiati, Lacedaemonioi, and Lacones. And the olive oil I mentioned came from Monambasia, which is down in the southeast in the Malaya Peninsula. But the absolutely key fact about the Spartans' territory, apart from its huge extent, it was easily the biggest polis in the entirety of Hellas, is the fact that it had two riverine valleys, one in Laconia, one in Messenia, exceptionally fertile for the growing of, uh, of course, we mentioned olives, but also wheat, barley, and the grapevine. So the most, I think, prominent and certainly beautiful geographical feature of Laconia Messenia is a mountain range which uh, rises north of Sparta, quite a way north of Sparta, and runs out all the way down into the central prong of the Peloponnese, southern Peloponnese, called the Mani Peninsula. It's where the Greek War of Independence began in the 1820s, 1821, which is one of the many interesting facets of the history of this part of Greece. At any rate, this mountain range is known as Taigetos. And what I'm showing you is the peak district of Taigetos. It rises to 2,404 meters. So it's over 8,000 feet. The snow lies on the mountain tops until May. It's very, very difficult to get across. There are passes, but not for an army. So if Sparta wishes to get its troops to the other side of Tegetos, where it has conquered that bit of southwest Peloponnese in the 8th and 7th centuries, it has to go round Tegetos. So you start up the Eurotas Valley, you take a left through southern Arcadia, and then another left into Messenia, Messenia. Now, I chose this particular slide for, for two other reasons. One, in the foreground is a Byzantine church. Do recommend, if you ever get to southern Peloponnese, go to the Mani in particular. Some of the most wonderful Byzantine churches with frescoes still there, absolutely wonderful. But the other reason for mentioning this is it's very near where, quite recently, the late Bronze Age, or as we say, Mycenaean palace of Sparta was built. And the modern name is because of a chapel to St. Basil, Aios Vasilios. Uh, it's called Aios Vasilios. And if there ever was a Menelaus, Homer, ruler of Sparta, and if he did indeed have the wife whose face launched a thousand ships, namely Helen, the most beautiful woman in Greece, Helen of Sparta, before she became Helen of Troy, then this is where his palace was. Very interesting because it confounded the view of pretty much everybody that it must have been somewhere much nearer to modern Sparta. The general um, 
confluent where the Eurotas goes through Sparta. Surely it was somewhere near there. Well, that's about 12 kilometers north of where it actually was. So now a few slides to illustrate um, Spartan ways of representing humans, ways of representing gods, ways of representing masculinity, ways of representing femininity. So I start with um, the gentleman, if he was a gentleman, he was probably a thug, uh, on the left. And he is a hoplite, uh, ancient Greek word, hoplites, takes his name from what's missing from this bronze, very often was, his shield, which is basically a wood, about a metre wide, uh, very heavy actually, but these guys were fit in, in every sense. And also missing is his spear from his right hand. But you can see enough, I hope, to see that he's very fancily kitted out. So this is parade armour. What you may not quite realise at first view, right down the bottom, just behind his uh, calf, is one leg of an, in fact, four-footed creature. So his dog, and not just any dog, I'm going to come back to this with my uh, last slide, his hunting dog. The Greeks in general uh, regarded hunting as a particularly uh, masculine, male, uh, a kind of paramilitary exercise. And you might think, well, if you're catching rabbits or hares or birds, is that particularly brave, you know, um, in a military? Well, no, it isn't. But the animal that the bravest hunters hunted in real ancient Spartan life was wild boar. Now, there are quite a lot of wild boars still around in my part of the world, in Europe, including in, uh, in the UK, in England. But if you're a hunter of a wild boar in France, you're pretty careful to keep a good distance from your boar and to shoot it with a high-velocity rifle bullet. The ancient Greeks had no high-velocity rifle bullets. They hunted on foot and they hunted up close and personal with special strengthened spears, boar spears, the game, the quarry, having been identified by the Laconian hound, it was a generic name as well as a geographical one, which was particularly famous in the female of the species for its scenting ability. So you sent your dog ahead, and in certain circumstances, and um, famously, the dog might actually confront the boar. But you would have your slaves with you, your helots in the case of a Spartan hunter, you'd have your net, but even so the risk of damage, uh, if not death, was still extreme. And those of you who know your odyssey will know that um, Odysseus's gash, his telltale scar on his inner leg, was caused by the tusk of a boar. So there is a Spartan in all his glory as a hoplite. Well, I'm going to call him a hero. Of course, they all fought en masse. Uh, an individual hoplite is a sort of contradiction. It did occur, but it wasn't recommended and it wasn't valued. So I, I mentioned at the beginning, one of our issues, general issues, is how normal, how typical was Sparta. Well, one key dimension of it is to what extent did the military factor, i.e. thinking about war, preparing for war, organising your society and its education and its comradely groups and its values in terms of warfare, martial values. Uh, how far was Sparta at one end of the spectrum, i.e. very martial, if not predominantly, or was it somewhere near, as it were, the middle, you know, sort of normally 
Marshall. Well, I'm one of those who goes for the um, extreme, uh, that it was very, very extremely, if not sometimes excessively, Marshall. Looking on the right side is a partial confirmation of my view. I mean, one of the reasons why I hold that view is that the superhero, the role model, the ultimate, I mean, Spartans thought of him literally as a physical ancestor of not just their royal families, and Sparta was unique in having two ruling kings, two royal families, by hereditary descent. This guy, Heracles, famous for his relationship with Hera, Heracles, he was deemed to be the ultimate progenitor of not just those two royal Spartan lines, but the entirety of the Spartan aristocracy who called themselves Heraclidae. We are all, we aristocrats, as opposed to commoners, we are all descendants of Heracles. Now, Heracles is a very controversial figure, not, not specifically in Sparta, but um, in general. And actually, this image, which is currently in the British Museum, 6th century BC, rather well illustrates one of the contradictions. On the one hand, he is, well, unquestionably male. That's why the genitals are thrust in your face. Secondly, he is unquestionably wearing a hoplite breastplate in ancient Greek thorax and a hoplite helmet uh, in ancient Greek kunei or kranos. But what's that strap going round his shoulder and under his right arm? What's that lion skin doing round his waist? Uh, how did he kill, in other words, the Nemean lion? Was it as a hoplite or was it rather by using archery? If I were able to turn this bronze around, you'd see that the strap is a quiver strap. So he's both an archer and a hoplite. And yet in real life, hoplites, good, archers, I'm going to come back to this point, well, dubious. At any rate, foreign, if they're Persian, very bad. Think of Thermopylae. If they're Greek, well, they're second rank and sort of inferior fighters fight at a distance with bows as opposed to face to face with a spear. Now, Heracles was worshipped. This is an object of worship. So he represents masculinity. He represents two kinds of fighting. But he also liked not just um, boys, which he did. He had a particular boyfriend. I'm coming back to that. But also women whom he treated. Well, you remember what I said about Eros in its negative sense, what it might encourage or incite you to do to females if you're a red-blooded male and not very considerate. Heracles was ultra-masculinist in that respect, for which some would have admired him, but if you were a woman, you might have thought slightly differently. So the iconic, and he really is iconic, uh, figure of Spartan myth religion and gender identification is a very complex figure in many ways. So we've talked about the boys, what about the girls? I'll skate over uh, the question which is um, implicit in the title I've given to this slide, dancing slash running, because I could have put a question mark after it. She's about the same period, second half of the sixth century. She comes actually from Albania, southern Albania, a place called Prizrend, and she's now, like the Heracles, the Hercules, in the British Museum. Well, one interpretation of her is that she's running. I actually think she's more likely to be dancing, but that's a, a complicated discussion. But I'm more interested in the way in which she is depicted in terms of her vestments, her clothing. 
That's to say, one of her breasts, which is developed, she's not prepubescent, she's at least pubescent, possibly a young woman, late teens in other words, uh, is very prominent, whereas, now I'm sure you know, it's a convention of Greek art, that is generically, Greek, all Greek, as opposed to any specific place, not to represent the female figure, whether divine or human, unclothed. This is, by Spartan standards, relatively modest. Only one breast shown, and she's wearing a tunic, a kitoniskos, a little tunic. So most of her is covered up, including her sexual uh, pubis. But those of you who've got Michelle's email, an earlier email, will know there are mirror handles made in Sparta of this period, second half of the sixth century. One of them's in your Met Museum in New York, representing totally naked females in a totally positive way. Whereas, go to Athens. Yes, you will see on a red figure cup used in the symposium, the boozing party, where the entertainment was provided for the men who were the hosts by slave, typically, entertainers and uh, women who would be at a certain point uncovered, unclothed. So they are depicted naked on these vases. That's how it was. But for an, a good as it were, Greek, female, to be depicted in front of men wearing no clothes. Shameless. Well, now, I think it may be the case that among the, this is a very late source, and it's part of the mirage or myth, which states as a fact, you know, the Spartans, that is the men, were utterly disgusting in their sexual morality. If a visitor, a foreign visitor, went to Sparta and was entertained in a Spartan's home, he'd be offered a Spartan girl for sex. You know, they're so shameless in Sparta. They, they um, dish out their, their females to foreign visitors. Well, to me, that's obviously a part of the negativity of non-Spartans who want to pour as much dirt as they can to trash Sparta in every way. Well, now, how does one then explain the Met Museum mirror handle of a naked Spartan female? Well, the Met's own little blurb is rather disappointing. It says, well, in the Middle East, there were goddesses like this. And yes, Sparta did have connections with uh, the Middle East of various sort. Or it could be a representation of Artemis, the local version Artemis or Thea, she who raises up or upright Artemis. And sure, Artemis was a big deal, goddess of wild nature on the frontier, huntress, very pro a virgin, so never dominated by a man, never deflowered. Yes, there's something to be said for that, but I'm going to go further and say that Spartan young women young, um, mainly teenage women, were allowed to, indeed encouraged to, through the educational cycle, exercise naked, just like men in other Greek cities. That is indeed why gymnasiums are called gymnasiums, because it's where you exercise gumnos, stark, naked. So this to me is all part of my uh, shtick, that the Spartans did things very differently from other Greek cities. Well, let's move on. That young lady of the previous slide would have been nailed to the top of a vessel something like this. Now, this is utterly exceptional. Size, beauty, um, where it was found in a non-Greek tomb in southern France, in Burgundy, a place called Vix. And it's a cratia, which means it's a mixing bowl for mixing wine with water. Well, I'm not so interested in the function of the vessel, but in 
couple of its attributes. What you can't see, but uh, on the handles underneath these volute handles, just see a bit of it on the right. Well, there are lions, but next to the lions are what are called gorgonia, images of gorgons, and gorgons petrify you, literally. So in other words, military. If you want to terrify and petrify your enemy, you gaze on them or you direct a gorgon eye on that one. So for example, Spartans had images of gorgons on their shields. That then is male masculine. Likewise, the um, scene around the neck, which is a procession of hoplites, is a rather good one. Notice his total nudity, heroic nudity. He would not have looked like that on the battlefield, but he's holding his hoplite shield and he's got his hoplite uh, helmet. Now, what's not shown here, but rather, I, I don't know quite what to make of it. There was a lid that went with this extraordinary vessel. Made, I would say, I believe in Spartan. Not everybody believes that, but I believe it was. The lid is in the form of a female figure, the handle of the lid, not naked or semi-naked, like the mirror handle I mentioned, or the dancing running girl from Prisrand, but draped, demure. So conceivably a goddess or an ideal representation of what a Spartan wife should look like. At any rate, I think it's a rather nice symbolic image. Below the men, below are the men, but above the men are, is a woman. And this chimes with, I mean, one doesn't know quite how much credence to give it, but famous saying, a laconic saying, Spartan mother to her son, just about to go off to battle, um, with it or on it, etan, e, epitas. So come back alive, carrying your shield, the most important item of your hoplite equipment. Or if you die, and of course, there are stories that Spartan mothers whose sons died rejoiced, whereas the mothers of sons who survived were terribly broken up about that. How sad, my son didn't die for Sparta. At any rate, that somewhat emblematic injunction of the Spartan mother to her son, that's a form of love, agape, uh, as well as an interesting comment on the relationship between a mother and her son, unique. In other words, that sort of utterance is not ascribed to Athenian mothers or Theban mothers or you name it. There were about a thousand ancient Greek cities. So, Leonidas, or as you say, Leonidas, Leonidas in modern Greek, or we say Leonidas, which of course is not right. But anyway, this probably isn't <laughs> Leonidas, um, partly because the sculptor almost certainly was not Spartan. This Parian marble, marble from Paros figure, was not a unique figure, but part of a group from a temple pediment. And therefore, he is a hero in a technical sense. He's not a human. He is a above human, a superhuman. And on his left cheek, you can see his cheek piece, is a ram. Well, that's one of the most sort of testosterone fueled animals. So you want to have that sort of testosterone coursing through you as you face the enemy. Well, I mentioned the um, Moller uh, Laber injunction, <clears throat> come and get them, allegedly uttered by the real Leonidas at Thermopylos, the Mopoli, in 480 BC in response to an order from Xerxes, Persian emperor, he's invaded Greece, massive army, a mm, couple of hundred thousand, something like that. Leonidas is defending the pass. Xerxes is eventually going to block him up at both ends and Leonidas is going to die. But early on, Xerxes sends a message through a Greek-speaking uh, interpreter 
give up your arms, surrender. You're going to be surrounded. It'll all be over soon. You might as well give in now. To which the reply allegedly came, and it's classically laconic, just two words. Uh, we in English have to use four, come and get them, or come and get them. Molon, which is a, an aorist participle of the verb to go, so it means come or go, uh, and it's addressing Xerxes in the second person singular, which is the what's called familiar imperative, uh, thou as opposed to you. It's an insult, labe, take, literally, come, take. Well, heroic in its context. What I'm interested in, though, is not so much that, but Leonidas's personal familial status. He was about 60 in 480, so quite elderly, but he had a much, much younger wife. Now, you remember the Gorgonia, the Gorgon images on the Vix Kratia? Leonidas's wife was called Gorgo meaning Gorgon. I mean, can you imagine giving your daughter the name Gorgon? What would men think of such a name? Anyway, um, her father, Gorgo's father, was a king, Cleomenes I. Leonidas was his half-brother. And so what you have here is an uncle-niece marriage, not considered um, incestuous, as indeed it's not been considered incestuous in a number of other societies. It's dynastic. But notice the gulf in age. Uh, Gorgo was born about 508 BC. So when she would have married, Spartan wives married typically later than Greek girls generally, in her late teens. She would have been married to him about the time of um, the Battle of Marathon, about 490. So when Leonidas was about 50. Well, now, that's a quite a significant <laughs> age gap of 30 years. And one hopes that there was arrows as well as agape between them. At any rate, they produced a son. But what one knows about marriage in Sparta. Now, this is a case where one might be being very seriously misled by the mirage, is that Spartan men didn't simply marry their wives, but they captured them. And the act of capture, which may or may not have been ritual, symbolized the, the effecting of the union, the very fact of a husband capturing and in some way imprisoning, and then having sex with on the, the marriage night in the hope of obviously impregnating, etc., etc. But you, I think you get the picture. It's not exactly consensual. It's not exactly feminist. And so whatever one says about the status, legal and um, social, of, of women in Sparta, which does seem to have been relatively high, in relation to that of the men, compared with other Greek societies. The marriage ritual symbolizes that sort of martial aggression, that masculinism, that I think is a thread running through ancient Spartan society. Famously, uh, this is the pass of Thermopylae, it's slightly changed, uh, to put it mildly, in its topography today. It's about a kilometer from the sea. Whereas in 480 BC is actually on the sea. And opposite, you can just see the sides of the little hill on which the fine old view held out to the end of this famous 300 spuns. Now, actually, not all 300 died. This is a modern myth of Sparta. Herodotus makes it quite clear that two of them survived, and that was quite complicating and quite difficult for the survivors. One of them suffered such severe survivor guilt that he committed suicide on returning to Sparta because you weren't meant to come back alive if you were part of that squad. Now, the interesting thing, well, one of the many interesting things about that squad is that it wasn't the normal royal bodyguard. 
not. Each of the two kings normally could call on a bodyguard of 300, you know, absolutely specially selected young men in their 20s, between 20 and 29. The squad that Leonidas took to Thermopylae was specially picked, and it was picked on one particular basis, apart, of course, from the fact they must be brave. And, you know, the sorts of people are not going to run away when they see the Persians. The criterion was that they were not just married, but that they had a child and not just any child, but a son. And the point of that, well, it seems to me obvious, it doesn't seem obvious to everybody, is that you are going to die but you've left behind you a son who will revere you, your memory, will carry on your line physically and eventually replace you as a member of the full Spartan army. So that's um, the 300. Now, a very different sort of representation, early 19th century, one of my favorite painters, a neoclassical painter, Jacques-Louis David, nothing less than Napoleon's official court painter. Now, Napoleon couldn't understand why. Um, David spent so much time, he took years over this painting, when the Spartans had lost. Thermopylae was a defeat. How could you spend so much time over a bunch of losers? Well, there are various reasons that could be put forward. But if I tell you that David was in our vocabulary today gay, and if you then look first at the buttocks of the young uh, male on the right side, if you then look at where um, David has placed the scabbard of uh, Leonidas right smack bang across his um, pudenda, his idoia, as the Greeks called it, his shameful bits, his genitals. Well, I think you get the point. This is a painter particularly interested in homo eroticism. And the Spartans were particularly, as I say, either famous or notorious, apart from the way they allegedly treated their uh, young girls, you know, sort of prostituted them. Apart from that, as between men and men, they were particularly famous or notorious for being practicing, well, our word gives the wrong, uh, entirely the wrong impression, and, it, and it's um, pederasts. Pied erastia in ancient Greek means eros for pides. Pides can be of either uh, sex, male or female, but in this case, male. So it's people who strongly desire sexually pides, young boys, sub adult, below the age of 18 boys. Well, I'm of the view, I'm probably. Um, not um, widely followed, but some follow me, in believing that this was a part of the Spartan education. In other words, it wasn't an option. But when a boy going through the Spartan educational cycle uh, attained puberty, 13, 14, 15, he would then become potentially the love object of an adult male Spartan in his 20s or older, who might well also be married. So there's nothing exclusive about this. They're not homosexuals in an exclusive identity choice or sexual preference sense. They are homosexually practicing as part of education, military education, social and cultural education. The older partner is a mentor of the younger mentee. And just, in my view, it seals the deal. Spartans developed a unique vocabulary for this pairing relationship, such that the elder member of the pair was called the Aispnelas, he who breathes in something, inspires, would be a literal Latin-based translation. And people have argued, does that mean inject seamen, or possibly, or is it more uh, ethereal, less corporeal, and it means inspire in a moral, uh, cultural sense. And the younger one is called the hearer, aietas, 
Well, I think that's particularly revealing of the fact that so embedded was the cultural institution of paederastia that it acquired, it generated its own local vocabulary. Enough of David, quickly moving on, and just an illustration of the hoplite shield. This happens to be one that a Lacedaemonian was holding uh, on the, uh, at the Battle of Pylos uh, in 45 BCE, during the Peloponnesian War, actually on the island of Sphacteria, just off the Messenian coast. It was uh, found in the uh, Athenian Agora, which uh, Alex Zagares and I were talking about. Uh, the American school is located, uh, its dig house is located in the Athenian Agora, where this was found in the 1930s, because 292 Lacedaemonians were captured on the island of Factory. They surrendered very unspartan, very unmasculine, uh, and taken and held prisoner or rather hostage in uh, Athens, in a public prison. And there's a story in Thucydides, it's uh, book four, chapter 40, if you want to follow it up, where an ally of the Athenians, i.e. not an Athenian, but somebody who's on the Athenian side, goes up to this pen where these prisoners are being held and jeeringly says, hey, uh, you clearly, you guys, are not real Spartans, or you'd never have surrendered. To which one of the Spartans replies, ah, yes, but you see, we weren't fighting a true men against men war. What did for us, and the Spartans then used a local dialect word meaning arrows, which literally meant spindles. And spindles were uniquely feminine. Only women spin and not men. And of course, in Sparta, uh, the women, the Spartan women didn't uh, spin either because they had helots to do it for them. But anyway, the point was, we are men. We were not fighting against men. It wasn't a, an equal fight. And therefore, that's why we are imprisoned here. Rather interesting illustration of Spartan masculinism, at least in public. Well, now, another um, female of the species, a very, very famous one. You might have come across her before now. I'm nearly at the end and apologize for having been less than laconic with you this evening. Kings of Sparta. Well, I've mentioned that there are two royal houses in Sparta, and this royal house is the royal house of the Yuri Pontids, the Every Pontide. Kings of Sparta are, and then she says, my father, and that was Archidamos II, and my brothers, one of whom was a half brother, Argus the second, one of whom was a full brother, Agisilaos, Agisiles the second, and her name, Kyniska. Well, if you thought Gorgo was a funny name for an elite Spartan woman, try this one. It means little dog, puppy, or little bitch. Um, obviously related to the fact that Hunting with hounds, Spartan hounds, was an elite activity, and especially in the case of boar hunting. She goes on, victorious. What she means is she has owned and raised and paid for people to train and exercise a bunch of horses who are race horses who are going to compete in the four horse chariot race at the prime games. It's the prime equestrian event at the prime athletic and gymnastic games, Olympia, every four years. So we happen to know it's 396. And she did the same again, not necessarily with the same horses, who were probably mares, female, uh, in 392. With the chariot of swift footed horses, I have had this statue. The statue's gone. This is the base erected, and it would have been a bronze statue. I know she was no shrinking violet. Declare myself the only woman in all Hellas to have won this crown, crown of olives. Well, now we happen to have a bit of a backstory on this. The very fact that a woman would do this, the first woman in Greece. 
the Olympics had had horse racing since the seventh century. So, you know, getting on for 300 years, this is quite extraordinary. Uh, the first woman, but not just any woman, a princess and sister, full sister of the reigning Europonted king. Now, what was the relationship between those two? Well, there's no, not even a hint that there was any incest, as it might have been the case, were they uh, Egyptian uh, royalty. But did they get on? Was the agape of a brother-sister, Philadelphia kind? Probably not, because a contemporary source, Athenian, Xenophon, wrote a biography, a kind of encomium, of Agesilaus II, published after his death. And in it, Agesilaus is made to say that it was all his idea that Kyniska should get into the horse racing business. And after her huge success, unprecedented, he has to diss her. He's got to sort of play it down. Well, you know, the best kind of horses are war horses because that's when men ride them and they go to war on them racehorses. Well, if even a woman can win an Olympic victory with racehorses, enough said about the relative value of racehorses and war horses. Anyway, so I'm now going to take you right back. This is my conclusion. This is what's called a keeling. I'm, I'm inviting you to look into the tondo of a second half of the 6th century BC Kelix, found not in Sparta, but exported, because the Spartan production of these cups was very widely distributed to North Africa, to um, Italy, especially the Etruscan area, non-Greek, central uh, Italy, as far east as Samos, the island of Samos and so on. Well, it's sometimes said, this is part of the mirage. Oh, you know, the Spartans, totally uncultured. They were even illiterate. Well, that's completely false. They weren't. But did they never appreciate beauty? Did they never have any idea of um, non-utilitarian artistic production? The vases like this are sufficient answer to that one. So what do you see in the scene? At the bottom, tunny fish. Slightly strange, possibly an allusion to the fact this pot was going to be exported from Githion and eventually make its way to Italy. What about the scene, the main scene? Well, eagles, they're filling ornaments, though you might say they're symbols of Zeus, you might. But actually the main emphasis on the central figure, who is a fully adult male with a very prominent beard, and very long hair, with behind him similarly beautifully dressed, equally long hair, but no beard, a young, what, adolescent? I suggest to you this could be interpreted as the uh, Aispanilas and the Aitas of a piderastic relation in action in one of the most challenging uh, activities that Greek males could uh, indulge in, namely boar hunting. And the Spartans being the Spartans, they don't want to leave anything to your imagination. When you stick a spear into the backside of a uh, boar, as when if you go to Spanish bullfighting or you've watched it, blood pours out. And there it is, there's the blood. So this is blood and guts, Spartan masculinism within a, I think, possibly homoerotic, piderastic context. And on that note, uh, I leave you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, that's what I said while I was still muted. I say it a second time. That was absolute joyful and did it. And by helping us understand the past mores, you really enlighten us on some of the issues and sexual relations that are of paramount concern today. So I think your talk was about Sparta and so much more. So there were a number of questions asking, will this be online? 
your talk. So people want to hear it a second time and a third. Uh, yes, the, it will be on the club website. So you have to wait for that to occur, however. It won't take terribly long. Mitch will arrange it. But I do have some questions from the archaeology committee, which I'd like to raise right now. The first comes from Alex, who said, do the Helots' marital relationships compare to those of the Spartan citizens? And for those who don't know, Paul is the author of Helots and their masters in Laconia and Messenia. So we have the expert <laughs> on Helots as well as other subjects. <clears throat> Well, one of the things that I didn't mention, not deliberately, it just um, didn't uh, occur to me at the time, is the fact that the helots, apart from being subjugated and being, as it were, the working class of the Spartan state under duress, were also Greek. And so they had a history, a backstory. They worshipped more or less the same gods, goddesses, heroes, heroines, as their Spartan masters. But not a single helot text, i.e. by a helot, not a single image that certainly by a helot of a helot survives. So we have to look at them through non-helotic sources, and actually not Spartan so much as um, uh, Athenian. Athenian playwrights wrote plays, comedies, called helots. I mean, I'm not sure what they found to laugh at, but nevertheless, that is the fact. However, a much more sober source, uh, I mentioned him already, he's the historian of the Greek and Persian War, so Battle of Thermopylae, Battle of Marathon, is Herodotus, Herodotus Halicarnas, and he mentions in his vast history, by name, just three sources, and one of them is a Spartan. And he says, I went to Sparta and I met Archias, and I think his name, you know, it includes the word Archi, meaning rule, is an elite Spartan. And uh, he told me about this and that. Well, we don't know exactly what he told uh, Herodotus, but Herodotus was particularly interested in Sparta for obvious reasons. And he treats it very unusually as if it were not quite completely Greek. So there are certain customs there involving the kings in particular that don't seem to correspond to the customs of any other Greek city that he'd ever encountered. And he went over the, the entire Greek world and well beyond. Now, one of those customs was the way in which when a king died, everybody, not voluntarily, but had to mourn that king. First of all, they had to pitch up at his actual funeral, either as many as could, or a very good sampling of Spartans and Helots. And they had to seem to be very, very genuine in lamenting the demise of this king, calling him the greatest king we've ever had. Uh, you know, it's all terrific propaganda. Well, Herodotus describes the funeral ceremony, and actually I use that in one other book of mine. I wrote a book on the Gisales, and I use the funeral of the Gisales as the jumping off point for a discussion of funeral practices as regards the kings generally. And this is a very striking fact. Helots were not owned by individual Spartans. They were owned collectively by the Spartans. So they were, if you like, public slaves. So if the central body, the Spartan decision-making body, the ephors, the Senate and the Assembly decreed something, it was a law binding on every member of the Spartan state, every inhabitant. So you had no choice. When a Spartan king died, messengers were sent round, and the Spartan state is huge, 8,000 square uh, metres or 3,000 square miles, uh, square kilometres, sorry, or 3,000 square miles. So you've got to allow a few days before they get all round the Spartan state and then back to Sparta. Anyway, I hope that answers the question. 
does, but it raises another question from me. And I was trying not to ask my own questions. Um, we had a wonderful program about Hadrian's Villa and there was slave quarters. If slaves, the Halots are owned by the spotter itself, were there special residences where they lived? Yeah, big discussion. Um, as I've tried to indicate, there are a number of issues on which we moderns take mm -hmm. diametrically opposite view. And mm -hmm. uh, the one uh, in this case is, did the Halots live in villages or reservations, plantations? Yeah. And the general view is, that, yeah, the general view is that they lived in villages. And so they lived like ordinary free peasant Greeks. And they would go out from their villages to the fields. So the villages would be dotted along the river and valleys, along the side of them, and they would go out daily, come back in the evening. And one thing just to add to what I said before, Helots had husbands and wives. I mean, Herodotus uses the word as if they were free Greeks. Uh, they're Greek and they therefore marry, and presumably without marriage by capture. I mean, I'm assuming that was peculiarly, oh, yeah. uniquely Spartan. So the answer to the question is that I believe they lived scattered in villages. And there's a good, if you like, there's a good, um, um, mm. purely strategic reason for that. If you are worried that significant numbers of them might at any time rebel because they have a collective consciousness, mm. because they're Greek, because freedom is a big Greek thing, then actually one way of um, minimizing the threat is to have them not on plantations, extensive collocations, but have them scattered among lots and lots of different villages within which, now this is more um, complicated, the evidence is by no means conclusive, probably there were what you might call Uncle Tom helots, i.e., People who are helots, but they, as it were, represent the Spartans in their village. They're the village headman, they organize the labor, they punish helots who are recalcitrant, they enable Spartans to come and, I'm sorry to say, they practice terror on the helots. I won't go into all the details, but there are various reasons for thinking the helot communities would be divided amongst themselves, divide and rule, being a fundamental imperial uh, tactic, of course, of empires uh, since when, since forever. Well, this goes along with what I said. Your talk helps us understand a larger societal picture than just the specific topic itself. A question from Margaret on the committee. She's particularly interested in the ha House of Atreus and Clytemestra successfully rules Mycenae during Agamemnon's absence. Penelope, another Spartan, also ruled Ithaca successfully, and Helen's from <laughs> Sparta. Is there something yeah. specific to Sparta that inspired the role of women in these stories? And of course, Helen, her sister Clytemestra, they were first cousins to Penelope. So then I say, and specifically to this unique family that brought forth strong women. Yeah, completely right. Helen and um, Clytemestra were half-sisters, technically, um, <laughs> one being born from an egg and one being born from a woman. I mean, this is myth, you see, not, not mm -hmm. uh, history. And Helen, you and I might say, was horribly, you know, almost stereotypically the little woman. She allowed herself to give way to her sexual desire for Paris, also known as Alexander. She committed adultery, which in other Greek cities, though interestingly not so much in Sparta for complicated reasons, adultery was about the worst crime that a married woman could commit, you know, worse almost than murder. So at any rate, she was a very bad woman, hence famous play called Helen, which Euripides wrote, and he has Helen on trial and the arguments for and against and so on. But Herodotus is um, very interestingly of the view, women like that, you know, they don't go under duress. 
she was not snatched and seized. She went willingly. Well, if you're a Spartan husband, uh, Menelaus, you didn't take that view at all. Um, for you, she was a good woman who had been badly treated by this alien prince who had destroyed the bonds of hospitality, you know, and so on and so on. Now, the question asks whether is there something peculiar about Spartan women that might be projected in myth? Well, part of the problem is we don't know. It's a chicken and egg. Which comes first, the myth or the real status of Spartan women? Well, Helen's much more interesting, actually, than Clytemnestra in this regard, that she is thought to be a combination of, yes, if there was a Bronze Age uh, queen of Menelaus, then that's a human, holy human, Helen. But there's another Helen who's a goddess, and this pitches up, it's in Herodotus. And she has a shrine, as I'm sure people know, not far from Sparta, a place called Therapne, though the shrine is named after her husband. It's the Menelaon, but it should actually have been Menelaus and Helen Eon. At any rate, in that guise, Helen is a, probably a fertility goddess, certainly a goddess of nature, fertility, increase, sexuality, you know, sort of a, um, like Aphrodite in a minor key. Which reminds me, by the way, I didn't make the point. All gods and goddesses in Sparta, when there was a public image of them, the image showed them naked. So Aphrodite, okay, mm. that's quite it. Artemis, Athena, naked. Pretty weird, if you believe the source. At any rate, what about Clytemnestra? Well, of course, uh, Agamemnon had to woo and win her. So in some sense, it's an arranged marriage. And why would he come to Sparta? Well, that's where his brother is married to Clytemnestra's half-sister. So there's a sort of dynastic, and there may be a real historical basis. In other words, the most powerful king of late Bronze Age Greece wishes to extend his power through a diplomatic marriage. And so you marry somebody from the royal family of Sparta. Yeah, it makes sense. Now, um, of course, what one makes of Clytemnestra is anybody's guess. Uh, in Homer, she's a bad woman because while Agamemnon's away, she takes a lover. And she takes a lover from a rival family that has a hereditary enmity with the Atriots. So therefore, if you want to pick someone to have a sexual relationship with, and you want really to irritate your marital relations in Mycenae, then you have sex, you take as a lover, somebody like Aegisthus. It's a bit like if you're, um, shall we say, Jewish, and you take a, a Muslim boyfriend. That's as a, oh my God, no, anything but that. And so, Clytemnestra was therefore either brave or shameless. Take your pick. In Homer, who kills Agamemnon when he returns in the bath? Does anybody know that? Well, you, your guess is uh, the right one. It's Aegisthus, because that's what men do. It's the lover who kills the husband. Go to um, Aeschylus, you, uh, the very first play, the Agamemnon. Here is Clytemnestra, and she is man. Well, the, the Greek word means literally something like has a manly counsel. She thinks like, she behaves like a man. And it's she who kills Agamemnon in the bath with an axe. Mm -hmm. Not the sort of thing a nice woman should do. So, you know, it's possible since Sparta and Athens were always at each other's throats, almost always. In 458, they were actually fighting each other in battle. So to make a Spartan woman look bad on the Athenian stage, there you go. Very okay? Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> more than I asked, and I think it's a fuller understanding that you gave us. From Jody on the committee, um, who sent me a lot of questions, but I'm going to ask one. Did the Spartans feel that homosexual relations actually strengthened fighting skills and morale? 
as opposed to the modern armies, which have either banned homosexuals from military service, or like the US military only allowed it reluctantly after years of litigation. And he asked also, did Spartans ever allow women to fight in the military, units designed just for women? Right, so... As opposed to point is about our, confused. First point is about our modern Western reception yeah. of homosexuality in mm -hmm. moral terms, and it's in particular religion and mm -hmm. law, the mm -hmm. Judeo-Christian tradition, is virulently hostile. So if you're going to be what we now call a gay, a homosexual, in such a culture, you're going to be counter-cultural. And in the 19th century, which is when things started to open up, what Oscar Wilde called the love that dare not speak its name was cultivated among, was practiced by elite intellectual um, males who were not military, not imperialist. Everything they stood for was counter to the dominant masculinist imperialist, especially I'm thinking, of course, Britain, British imperialist tradition. And then secondly, it goes with it, um, very nasty words used to denigrate homosexual males, pansy, fairy, are ways of saying unwarlike. If you are gay, by definition, you are not suited. We don't want you in the military. There's a radical opposition. Now, the ancients were the exact opposite. To be a real man is to have sex not only with women, but also with boys. Mm -hmm. To be a real man in Sparta is to imbibe a culture where such behavior is the behavior of Heracles, the uber-masculine martial man. Now, of course, they fought collectively. I mean, it's very important that one emphasizes that militarism in a Greek polis was not a matter, as it was in Homer, of individual prowess, heroic excellence but collectivity. So any practice, any behavioral practice that reinforced bonds of solidarity of a collective nature would conduce to fighting better. If I'm right, pederasty was actually embedded as a requirement in the Spartan educational system with a moral, not just physical, implication and overturn. So that's the answer to that question. The second question, were women, were there any, as it were, like in Dahomey, there was a women's regiment who are, of course, likened not to ancient Greek women, but to non-Greek Amazons. And the Amazons are, as it were, the opposite of a typical Greek woman. They don't want children. They fight in war. They have only one breast, not two. They do all sorts of terrible things that women, real, nice, my wife, my sister, my daughter, must not do. At any rate, um, the answer is no. But women were, by definition, the non-military half of the adult citizen population of Sparta. And we're told, whether we believe it or not, this is Xenophon, when the Thebans, leading 70,000 troops, invaded Sparta's territory, first time ever, Sparta had had this territory 400 years, first time a foreign army, Greek, penetrated the northern frontier and got near Sparta. The women, this is both Xenophon and Aristotle, who were neither of them really feminists, said the women caused more problems than the men because they were so terrified. You know, they went berserk, they screamed and wailed, and they didn't control themselves in a properly masculine way. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, when you were talking about Heracles, I was thinking of Zeus and Ganymede also. Yes. Well, Zeus, this is his cupbearer, and you know where Ganymedes comes from. He comes from Troy. And Zeus, of course, had his pick 
of, of anybody. And he's the ultimate, by the way, ancestor of the Spartan um, royal families and aristocrats, because he's the father of Eurycles. Um, but he's, well, just a universal sexual predator. And um, Ganymede was... Uh, one of his conquests. In my Thebes talk, I'm pretty sure I mentioned, Zeus disguised himself as a bull so that he could have his wicked way with Europa. And uh, Europa was the sister of Cadmos. She wasn't Greek and she wasn't European. She came from Tyre, which is in modern Lebanon. At any rate, that's the foundation, that's the origins of uh, the Theban city. Uh, complicated, to put it mildly. But uh, Zeus grabbed her, I mean raped her, and took her off to Crete, which is where she was the mother of Pasiphae, who then produces the Minotaur. So not an entirely, um, you know, wonderful inheritance in mythical terms. We also have a question um, that, I'm not reading it correctly, I'm sure, but puts an erotic component as coming from Crete. So I don't know the first half of the question. Um, but doesn't Menelaus go off to Crete at one point and leaves Helen with Paris? Is that one of the versions? Yeah, I yeah. Not, well, well, the version in Stesigorus and um, taken up actually by uh, Euripides is that mm -hmm. Helen never went to Troy. She mm -hmm. went to Egypt where she lodged with the king, local king, and merely an image of her, an idolon, what we would call a simulacrum, was what, if you're looking at this image on the walls of Troy, that's not a real person, that's just an image of her. But um, the standard view is the Homeric one. And he went to Troy, he led with his older brother Agamemnon, the armies, just to get her back. So he came back via Crete mm -hmm. to, that's a different point altogether, but with her, he mm -hmm. got her in, uh, in Troy. And there's a famous passage, I think it's in Euripides, in Euripides <laughs> where he's very rude uh, when he sees her first. He says, my, you've aged a bit, haven't you? <laughs> well, he's been away, yeah. I mean, it, she's been away 10 years and he's looking at her breasts. So, um, well, that's another story. I, I won't go into that for the minute, but there's quite a lot to be said about the breasts of women in Sparta. Real women. Like. <laughs> Send me a postcard or email. Yeah. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. Um, I can't thank you enough. I want our audience to know that the club Zoom lectures are only supposed to last one hour. I scheduled this for one and a half hours, knowing Paul Cartledge or you did shit, and that we so enjoy learning from you all the time. I can't thank you, and I thank the club for giving me this extra time. There's so many fascinating questions. You'll get the list of them, Paul, from me. Um, so I thank you deeply. And a reminder regarding our next event held at the National Arts Club on March 4th at 5.30 p.m. Now, this is live. Professor Eckert Fram of Yale University, along with attorney and club board member, Raymond Dow will discuss Tales from the Temple of Istar. I look forward to seeing some of you then. And I have a question, Mitch. I've made it to 1.30. I'm sorry, one and a half hours, <laughs> rather. Is there any way we can continue this and then you shut us off, or must we be blocked from this we moment on? For, we can go for about another 10 minutes. Okay, well, I'm delighted. I have more questions. Paul, I hope you're good. <laughs> um, this you related to, but not completely, with the royal family and an uncle and a niece. What was the opinion of Spartans of sexual relationship between biological family members? We consider incest, but, if, but what if it's dynastic, it's one thing. What about non-dynastic? Okay, well now the Spartans, this is again a problem of the mirage. Remember I said the evidence for Sparta, mm -hmm. some of it may be completely made up, 
Some of it may have a real basis. Um, we can never be quite sure. Well, there is a very late source which says mm -hmm. that uniquely the Spartans allowed a brother and a sister who had the same mother but different fathers to marry. So that means the same genetic mm -hmm. inheritance from the mother. Now, all other Greek cities permitted the same people who have the same father but different mothers to marry. So that implies the Spartans had a very low level incest taboo. So uncle, niece, well, that's quite a bit more separated by generation and by, well, potentially it could be an uncle by marriage um, from brother, sister of the same womb. So, you know, that's, that's all I can say. There wasn't a strong, certainly, incest to be against uncle-niece marriage of any sort. And it may even be the case that they permitted homo, people who had the same mother, homo matrio is the Greek, to marry each other. Mm -hmm. I just got um, an email that Rob Bobby Cole asked a question referred to Crete. So, Bobby, I hope we end. That was your question that I just raised. In that case, Bobby has spoken at the club on Crete. He's a former committee member and a good friend. So thank you for joining. Um, now, yeah. how did the women feel about the homosexual relations between the men? Do we have any written textual evidence of this? Um, as I say, I mean, this is true of all Greek cities, not just Sparta. Sparta's mm -hmm. evidence is skewed, but it's not skewed differentially in the fact that women have left virtually no testimony for themselves. The only testimony that they've left is what are called dedication. So a female name dedicates this, and it might be um, an item of clothing to Artemis or to Athena. But that doesn't tell you anything about, as you say, their mentality, their mm. outlook on um, the way in which sexual relations uh, across society were managed. But uh, this is where one gets into the issue of how far were women able to develop any independent, let alone collective consciousness, i.e. of themselves as women as opposed to men. And the external sources, uh, Aristotle, Xenophon and so on, they tend to present the view that in that respect, Sparta was quite normal. Women were, as it were, second-class citizens. They had no public political say whatsoever. They might be influential morally on their sons, but that was entirely in line with the dominant masculine ethic of martial valor. Sons must be brave. They mustn't be cowards. But what they thought about the fact that they're, let's say they're married, uh, age 18, 19, and their husband is not yet 30, and he's had a relationship since, let's say, mid-20s, age 25, with a teenager who, when he started the relationship, was 14. So he's going on, he's late 20s, he's married, but he also has a, a younger male partner. Interesting. All I can say is that is certainly what happened in Athens. A married man might have boyfriends on the side in the way that in some other unenlightened societies of different periods, you have aristocrat male who have mistresses on the side. They're married, but they have sex outside marriage. Well, um, we don't know whether a Spartan woman would have thought that because there is a, a strain of evidence, and it's um, actually slightly relevant to what you were asking me about strong Spartan women, that in the home, because their husbands were away so much, uh, either training for war or in education or actually fighting, they didn't spend much time at home. So the women ran the home in a very strong way. They would look after the economics. They would tell the household helots what to do on the day and so on and so on. And it's thought that that would compensate them 
for any feeling of loss in the fact that their husbands were away, that they were not given any public political um, position whatsoever. There were priestesses in Sparta, so females, that's uni not unique to Sparta, there were priestesses in every Greek city, and they had to be women, and they had to be citizens. But um, that's all I can say, that the Spartan women might have felt, well, I've got untold labor at my disposal, I've got control of my household, I'm not going to be so fussed by what my husband does outside the home. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I don't know if we can use the word bisexual for the men as we sometimes use today, but as I was researching for your talk, I came across what I hadn't known previously, and that was that there was lesbianism also in Sparta, and female poetesses who wrote about it. And that I found fascinating. Right. We also spoke about the education right. afforded to women. Well, I've got to say that poetesses are not so extraordinary because um, obviously everybody's heard of Sappho and Praxilla and Noesis. And, you know, there are a number of Greek well known um, women, Anity, blah, blah, blah. But it's just, I must emphasize one passage, one mention. In a biography by Plutarch of the supposed founder, the legislator who laid down the moral, economic, the political code, the military for all Spartan life. And this is Lycurgus. In the life of Lycurgus, he says elite women, not just any Spartan women, also like, in other words, he's been talking about the males, also form sexual mentoring relationships with young girls. That's just the one reference. So it's, as it were, an equivalent of mm -hmm. the, without the martial, the military dimension mm -hmm. of the male and part of the education. And not implausible, not utterly implausible, but unique. That's the only reference. Very interesting. As I said, I knew about Sappho, I did not know about anything connected with Sparta. And I did read the whole chapter. And so that, you know, I uh, took part of it and I sent it on to the archaeology committee. So they knew about like churches okay. also. So it, this has been Excellent. absolutely wonderful. And we could continue and continue. I thank for the club's indulgence. I thank you, Paul, for making this very special lecture for the club, the celebration of the arts possible. It's one I'm going to listen to repeatedly, I know, and gain. Sweet and we'll plan your next club you. event. <laughs> thank thank you, you, both you personally, and thank everybody else who took the time to listen and those who will listen in future. Thank you all so much. <laughs>